my name is Imav. My name is Fabrizio Antonio, and I'm a computer engineer at the Advanced Scientific Computer Division of the Euro Mediterranean Center on Climate Change. First of all, let me thank the AGI staff for inviting us to the AGI webinar program, and uh, thanks to all of you for attending this webinar. On behalf of the INES Data Space team, I'll give you today an overview of the <clears throat> INES Data Space, one of the data space services supported by the EGI ACE project. The activities have been carried out jointly by CMCC, the Euro Mediterranean Center on Climate Change, and the IKSL, the Institute Pierre Simon Laplace. Before starting, just a quick look at the agenda. The webinar uh, is organized around three main blocks. We'll start uh, with a general overview about the INES Data Space and its main features. Then HATF from uh, IPSL will introduce CINDA, the tool used to download datasets from the ESGF Data Archive. And finally, there will be a practical session where we'll see how to join the service and we'll learn how to get started with the data analysis and uh, visualization features. Of course, we'll also have time for questions and comments, so do not hesitate to ask for any question through the chat or the um, Google Docs shared by him. The HINES um, data space is uh, specifically designed to address needs coming from the climate change community, and in particular from the HINES community. HINES is the European Network for Earth System Modeling, which gathers together the European modeling community working on understanding and predicting climate variability and change, with I mean, the main objectives of delivering common strategies for the research infrastructure and supporting the dissemination of model results to the climate search and impact communities. The INES data space is also directly connected to CMIP, the Coupled Model Intercomparison Project, which is a collaborative framework designed to collect output from global couple of general circulation models and make this multimodal output publicly available in a standardized format. The CMIP consists of several phases, and how we can see from the CMIP data history, from CMIP 1 to the latest phase, CMIP 6, we have a more and more growing trend in terms of data volume. For example, for CMIP 6, we have an expected 10 times factor with respect to CMIP 5. And this, of course, poses significant scientific data management challenges in terms of data archiving, processing, analysis, and sharing. In this domain, large-scale global experiments for climate model intercomparison have led to the development of the Earth System Grid Federation, the ESGF, which is a federated data infrastructure for the management and access of uh, largely distributed data volumes for climate change research, involving dozens of data providers and modeling centers around the globe. ESGF supports the, the coupled model intercommunism project with the data archive, and currently the total ESGF archive manages several petabytes of Earth System science datasets, including uh, simulations, observational, and reanalysis data. When uh, we deal with large scale climate analysis, we have to consider some key challenges and practical issues. First, multimodal data analysis requires access to data produced by large-scale intercomparison experiments, as well as running workflows with tens or hundreds of data analytics operators. Downloading all the required input data from the distributed ESGF data nodes to the local machines is a, um, a big barrier for scientists who may face network instability, drop connection, and so on. In addition, they had to install and update the proper tools and libraries and prepare a set of batch scripts to process all the collected data. And this, this is usually done using client side and sequential approaches. And the last but not least, complex analysis usually calls for strong requirements in terms of computational and storage resources. The INES data space tries to address these challenges and needs with the main goal of providing a single entry point to an open and cloud-enabled data science environment for climate data analysis on top of the EOS compute platform. Specifically, it hosts the most relevant data sets from the ESGF Federated Data Archive and provides a customized data science software stack to enable a wide spectrum of multimodal semi-based data analysis use cases exploiting both storage and computational resources uh, provided by EGI. 
As anticipated at the beginning of the presentation, the INES data space is one of the data space services supported by the EGIAs project. In total, EGIAs includes 13 data spaces divided in five different domains, humanities, health and medicine, environmental sciences, energy and physical sciences, and climate research, which the INES data space belongs to. The um, INES data space architecture consists of several layers, and in terms of infrastructure, it integrates several open source services and tools. More specifically, the um, proposed solution implements a climate analytics sub-level on top of the existing ESGF data nose backbone. The analytics sub provides open science-oriented computing analytics capabilities on top of a data collector layer, which gathers and prestages the most relevant data set from the different ESGF data nodes, and keep the local copy of data synchronized with the remote copy available in the ESGF infrastructure. A user interface implemented through Jupyter Hub provides a single entry point to uh, this open data science environment where scientists can perform interactive data analysis and run analytics workflows. Their architecture also includes two orthogonal layers concerning security aspects addressed through the integration of the AGI check-in service as authentication and authorization infrastructure solution, and a monitoring layer relying on the Kubernetes dashboard. Going a bit more into the details, the deployment of the INES data space relies on the EC3 tool developed by the GreekUp I3M UPV team at the Universitat Politecnica de Valencia with the aim of creating um, an elastic um, virtual cluster on top of uh, infrastructure as a service providers. In this case, an elastic Kubernetes cluster is deployed on the cloud resources provided by the Tubitac ULAC Meme Center. The cluster elasticity is managed by Clues, which is uh, an, ener an energy management system used to power off internal cluster nodes when they are not being used, and to power them on when uh, they are needed. In this way, the cluster dynamically grows and shrinks according to the requested resources, for example, um, uh, memory, CPU, and the number of poles in a node. Each user is provided with a completely isolated environment deployed on the cluster working nodes in the form of Jupyter Lab environment. The entry point consists of a Jupyter Hub instance with authentication and authorization managed through the EGI check-in service. Any notebook and file stored in the user working directory is made persistent through the so-called persistent volume claim, which is the way in Kubernetes to request and uh, reserve a piece of storage in the cluster. I know that uh, this is a very technical slide, but uh, now let's move on uh, to something more user-oriented to describe the main feature of the Ines data space. As shown in the previous slides, a Jupyter Hub instance is used to give access to computational environments and resources without burdening the users with installation and maintenance tasks. To access the service in a uniform and easy way, the INES data space integrates the EGI checking service, which acts as a central hub to connect federated identity providers with EGI service providers. In this way, you are able to authenticate with the credentials provided by the identity provider of your own organization, for example, via Hedugain, as well as with the EGI single sign-on or using uh, social identity providers like Facebook, Google, LinkedIn, and Orchid. In addition, to meet the fine-grained authorization requirements, we created a dedicated virtual organization called vo.ines.org which can be simply considered as a group of users sharing resources across the EGI Federation. So to access the Ines data space service, you first have to create an EGI account, then join our VO using the enrollment URL provided in this slide. But uh, don't worry for the moment, uh, since we'll see this procedure in detail during the demo session. The computing environment relies on uh, Jupyter Lab, which represents the next generation user interface for Project Jupyter, offering all the familiar building blocks of the classic uh, Jupyter notebook, so notebook, terminal, text editor, file browser, and so on, in a flexible and powerful user interface. 
this environment comes with uh, a set of open source Python modules and community based tools that I'm going to show you in a while. The picture on the right side of this slide shows how each user workspace looks like. As we can see, it is organized around three main folders data containing the CMIP datasets downloaded from the ESGF archive, notebooks, including some ready to use examples, and the work, the persistent directory, where you can create and upload new files, which will be always available at each new session. And here I put the main open source Python modules that you can use for running data manipulation, analysis, and visualization. Going quickly through the list, XArray is a Python package that provides a toolkit for working with the labeled multidimensional arrays of data. Pandas offers data structures and operations for manipulating numerical tables and time series. NumPy offers comprehensive mathematical functions, linear algebra, routines, and much more. Shipai provides algorithms for optimization, integration, interpolation, statistics, and many other classes of problems. And for data visualization, we have the matplotlib module, which allows the creation of static uh, animated and interactive uh, visualization in Python, and Cartopy, which is a Python package designed for geospatial data, geospatial data processing, uh, and uh, in order to produce maps and other uh, geospatial data analysis. And we'll see in practice how to exploit these libraries and tools in the demo session. The Ines data space also includes the Ophidia high performance data analytics framework as a solution for scientific data management. Ophidia is a complete open source solution used to perform scientific data analytics by means of HPC paradigms and in memory based big data approaches. It provides support for parallel in memory server side data analysis and um, an internal storage model to manage uh, multidimensional data sets. In addition, Ophidia comes with a programmatic interface for the framework called PyOphidia, which is an open source Python library allowing a programmable integration of the Ophidia operators into more articulated and shareable data science applications. The Ines data space relies, relies on 150 terabytes cloud storage resources and provides access to a set of specific CMIP, uh, CMIP uh, variable centric collection from the EGF uh, Federated Archive. And Atev will give you additional details about data collection in this presentation. In general, before loading data and analyzing it, you may need to know what data sets are available the attributes describing each data set and how you can select and, ask, and access the specific data set. Intake has, is a data cataloging utility built on top of uh, Intake, Pandas, and XArray, and uh, is specifically designed for parsing and executing queries against an Earth system model catalog. In this way, it is possible to search and discover the available CME data sets and load the desired data assets, basically NetCDF files, into XArray datasets as well as into the Ophidia workspace. The Ines data space provides a web portal where you can find all the information to get started with the service. In addition, it is also accessible in the European Open Science Cloud through the HIOS portal catalog and, market, and, and marketplace which is the EOS platform acting as an entry point to a multitude of services and resources for researchers. And here are some useful links to find out more about some of the discussed topics. And now I leave the floor to Atef, who will talk about SINDA and the data management. Thank you. Thank you, Fabrizio, uh, for the presentation. Thank you, EGI, for putting this uh, webinar together. And thank you for everyone who's attending. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity also to uh, thank uh, the uh, INES uh, space that uh, enabled us to enter into, the, into this collaboration between CMCC and IPSL. 
this was a great opportunity to get the new uh, objectives done, uh, as I will discuss in this presentation briefly. So my presentation will be uh, less technical than the one Fabrizio did. I will basically don't I will not enter into deep details technical wise, but I will provide the links towards the uh, technical documents, and I will also provide my own contact information in case anyone is interested in getting a deeper uh, either explanation of what happens behind the scenes or want to get involved into the development. Uh, I have to highlight the fact that all our development is open source and uh, we, can we, uh, uh, we are open to any collaboration or any contribution happening from uh, any part of the world. We are always happy to get any help that we can get. So with that said, today I will be talking a little bit about the data space, the nature of the data that we have provided within the INES data space, as well as the tool set that we have either used to, um, to uh, download and replicate the data from the ES yet. Also the tools that will be available to you users because this data comes from ESGF. So that will also be interesting uh, to you as well, I think. So in brief, I will not uh, talk a lot about the uh, SEMIP data because Fabrizio already introduced it. We are dealing with the uh, data that is uh, coming from the SEMIP phase six in particular, which started in, um, in planning in 2013, but uh, distribution began back in 2018. So this is the most recent uh, exercise of uh, the coupled model intercomparison project. Uh, and the summit uh, six, it, uh, it is a, uh, a group of 20 through 23 MIPS uh, that is produced from 33 modeling groups from 16 different countries. So this is a huge uh, commitment from uh, international commitment. And today we are uh, around uh, the ex uh, a bit ex in excess of 26 beta bytes, if I'm not um, completely mistaken. So this will be available for public use through the ESGF network, like uh, Fabrizio just uh, described earlier, which is basically a group of international data nodes that is uh, all around, around the world. Now, what you see in this uh, graph is a map of the different uh, nodes that we have um, declared within the ESGF uh, federation. But you have to keep in mind that the ESGF federation have a different tiers of members. So we have members that are tier one and we have members that are tier two and tier three. And basically tier one are the most uh, in, uh, implicated uh, nodes that offer uh, data node uh, capabilities so they can uh, host data in their storage and they can have indexation. So they have Sol Apache Solar that provide people the ability to search for data. And sometimes they even have computational data. So this is just, um, a, a small detail. Uh, the SGF Federation has been operational since 2011, and since then there have been a lot of uh, development to, in order to make this more publicly uh, accessible, more uh, user friendly, which is not very easy because we are dealing with huge amounts of data. So we have this compromise between being functional, fast, being able to handle a large amount of data, and on the other hand, we want to be able to serve as many people as we can, which is not ideal, which is why spaces like the ENES data space uh, that can bring the data into some place that is very close to computational uh, capabilities is something very important. So it removes that complexity that the researcher has to go the extra length of understanding what is ESGF, how to download data from ESGF, where, who to talk to, et cetera, et cetera, which can be complicated. And I know that because I have been involved with an ESGF since 2015. So it's been more than seven years now. And I still sometimes struggle with uh, the technical um, issues that this federation sometimes has, which is something that is uh, completely understandable for a project that this size and uh, uh, that is very also um, the fact that it is internationally uh, held, it's not very easy to handle. Sometimes we have problems with uh, international issues such as the Brexit. Uh, recently we had a, a less um, implication from the US counterparts because they had their fun funding uh, reduced, et cetera, et cetera. So these are challenges that we have to deal with on a daily basis. And this is something that the ENES data space uh, wants to uh, omit and makes it easier for researchers not to deal with. 
So that being said, what we made, what we did with the Indus Data Space is that we took this set of data and we made available around 1.5 terabytes of uh, ESGF data. So earlier I said that there are a lot around 26 uh, petabytes and we made only 1.5 ter terabytes available. So you have to understand this is a, a major subset of the available data. Sometimes you can go on the ESGF index node and find other data sets, other files that they are not available around the ENIS data space. But this is um, not a, I wouldn't say this is a problem. This is a technical challenge because storage is expensive and we have to be uh, really uh, smart and wise on how to best use it. And to do this, we relied on the experience of another data manager at CNRS IPSL, who is not with us today, but I represent the same institute, who is Guillaume Leverseur, who has been a data manager at APSL for more than 10 years. So uh, we use the experience that he has from the user requests on the data that they are using in their day-to-day -day research in order to uh, try to subset the data that will be most useful to you researchers with the least storage possible. So what we did is we took the variables, uh, the temperature at the surface, precipitation, the eastward near surface wind, the near surface humidity, the near, sur uh, uh, the near surface humidity, basically, and we took them in two different frequencies, monthly mainly. So that's the most, the hugest bulk of the data will be in the frequency of monthly. Uh, but for the uh, temperature of the surface, we also made available the daily frequency. And of course, this is due to data storage constraints because if we made the daily frequency available across all the variables, that will increase exponentially the storage uh, requested. And we relied on 28 out of the 33 uh, models that are available on CMIP6. This is also uh, due to the fact that not all models uh, produce all the experiments. So in CMIP, there are uh, experiments that are considered the DEC experiments that are basically every model is and has to produce, but the rest of the experience are not uh, mandatory. So you cannot produce them. This is one explanation why we didn't take all the models. And we chose four experiments uh, that are the most uh, interesting ones that might um, uh, help you do your research and uh, do your computational uh, behind the scenes, which is the historical SSP245, 370, and F50A5. Um, this might sound like gibberish to you, which is not uh, something that I would find uh, at all uh, strange, but because these terms are very hard to, un to understand or comprehend as someone who just arrives to the climate data modeling world. And uh, this is a problem that we deal with every day, but I will uh, later expose how you can go through these data and um, efficiently exploit this data as much as possible. But before that, I need to talk about the Synda tool set that is the tool that we used to replicate and download the data. So like I said earlier, the ESGF ne uh, network is basically an international network of peer-to-peer -peer nodes. Uh, that is basically solar indexes, Apache solar indexes that you need to go to the search index, find your data, and then through wget or a curl request, you can download your files. But in order to do that file by file, it gets very tedious. And if you want to put your data in a specific space where you have computation to, it becomes complicated. This is why at IPSL, we started developing back in 2011, basically right when ESGF Federation started uh, building, we started building our tool that enable us to do exploration of the Federation, basically finding what data matches the criteria that we want and then download it. And not only stop at downloading, but also put the data in a specific directory format that we want so that the archive is easier to, to manage uh, from our part, which is super important for basically like if we wanted to do uh, an intake OSM um, catalog on top of that, that would be interesting to have the directory format already done when we downloaded the data. So this is the tool that we, we have used and it's still in development. So this is this has been a major investment at IPSL. Uh, it's been more than 11 years that it has been in development and it's still getting new features. Recently, we uh, like a few weeks ago, we made a new release on the tool and it has been even more efficient, faster to replicate and download the data. And most interestingly, it has been packaged through Anaconda. So 
even uh, random users that want to use this tool to replicate their own data, maybe locally or on their servers, they can use the, the, the service uh, as they please. There is a documentation uh, that is that should be easy to navigate that can explain the installation process, how to use it, et cetera, et cetera. And I have provid provided the links uh, on the slide so that you can visit these links at your ease after the presentation, uh, both the documentation and the GitHub repository. If you want to do like a cloning repository to change the, uh, the behavior, or you want to contribute to this open project. So this is basically Cinda in very, very short terms. If we want to go even deeper in, in, uh, into detail, so the basic usage uh, is basically mirroring ASGF. Cinda is used a lot by the data manager or, or data managers around ESGF because there is a very interesting activity that we do, which is replication of data. So for instance, us at APSL, we actively seek out data that is produced in the United States, in Germany, in Italy, in France, uh, in the UK, et cetera. And then we replicate it locally in France so that French researchers have uh, quicker access to that data. And for that, we use, uh, we use Cinda. Uh, it is a common blind uh, interface tool. So you need to be a little, at, least, at least a little bit comfortable with using common line. It um, enables you to do the data discovery through the parameters and it has been optimized recently with asynchronous downloads. So just to put this into numbers, last night we started downloading uh, around 20 terabytes. And during the night only, we managed to replicate already six terabytes so that you get a sense of what the tool is capable of doing. It's super fast, super light to download, it's super efficient. But I wouldn't recommend doing that on your own laptop because you will break your memory storage in no time. And of course, this uh, enables us to do local data management through the directories, like I said. Uh, it has uh, intelligence to find the nearest replica, so it doesn't seek data necessarily in Australia, if it can find it perhaps in the data node in Germany, et cetera, et cetera. So what can we expect from this tool soon, uh, since I said it's still in development? So for the time being, it is packaged through Anaconda, which is super user-friendly, but it's not cloud-friendly. And through this uh, Enes data space project, we have started toying with the idea of having a Docker container image, and I have been working on that and in contact with Fabrizio with this, and hopefully we will find a solution that will be able to be deployed uh, soon. Uh, we also working on having the software to be citable so that if you publish uh, a paper using the data that has been replicated on Cinder, you can cite the, uh, the software, which helps with the uh, fairization of the data so that to make the whole uh, chain of uh, how you downloaded the data, used, etc., all traceable. Uh, we are also constantly working on making the replication and download as fast as we can. But that's we have a uh, constraint with the data nodes because they are serving us the data and sometimes they have caps and they do not enable us to do as much as we can. They just tell us, yeah, you're using so much um, resources, we're going to cap you right there. So yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a very tight battle to win. And uh, there is also having a smoother user experience for non-power users because the data node managers, they already know the tool, they know the basic usage and the advanced usage. But we want to also that the normal users may be able to use Cinda at the, uh, if they wish to. And to do that, we need to make it more accessible to the uh, general public. And that's something that we are actively pursuing with the development of Cinda. So uh, we can ask the hypothetical question is that, what if the data that I wanted to use is not available within the generic 1.5 terabytes that we have provided the ENS database. Now, this will be subject to another, to the constraint of the data storage that I mentioned that it is very super tight. But if the data request that is coming from the researcher is uh, makes sense and it's not huge and it's not a big investment in storage wise, we could uh, ask Cinda to append the new data to the data pool. And the data request needs to only be, of course, needs to be reasonable. It needs to be well formulated. Uh, which, which project, which experiment, what's the frequency, what's the table ID, et cetera, et cetera. And if, it, if that is done, it can be fed to Cinda and Cinda will do the work basically and append the data to the uh, ENS data space. Uh, there is a, um, a script that runs periodically that also updates the intake of the SEM. So the catalog will reflect the new data in no time after that. 
And the other question that I asked earlier is what if I don't understand exactly what is the data that I have within my, my hands? So you can see the entire file name or the data set identifier with a lot of facet names that you don't recognize. So uh, to do that, luckily, since this data comes from ESGF, we already have a tool set that is uh, documenting this data that can be used by the ENS and FAX users as well, which comes from the Earth system documentation. So basically, this is a hub for documentation tools uh, that is that could be all linked from the main website that is esdoc.org. Uh, we have an explorer that enables you to explore all the terms uh, at your own ease through a web interface. And we also have the ESDoc search, which enables you also to search the terms to find their documentation and to find the different definitions of each facet, et cetera, et cetera. You can find the longer name that can also maybe ring a bell. And if that does not answer your question, you can find the entire description, the papers that have been published around that facet, et cetera, et cetera. Another question that could be asked is, what if I find something wrong with my data, which is something very, very possible to err as a human. So you can find a net file that has maybe the vectors that are inverted on production or something like that. So when you find that, generally speaking, the best ideal thing to do would be to notify the data manager, which contacts you can find in every file that you deal with. But if you want to also check whether the data that you have in hand is safe to use or not, and I say safe to use, I don't mean that there is dangerous to use data, but you can be, uh, you want to make sure that the data that you have doesn't have any known issues. And to do that, we have a also an issue tracker that is specific to ESGF data. Uh, that is accessible through the link errata.esdoc.org. It has basically an index of all the known issues that have been published on ESGF and also has an interface that enables you to search your files programmatically or through a user interface to find whether your data is affected by a known issue or not. Versions are very important for the ESGF data. So um, a newer version that has been um, published to ESGF generally means that the older version has an issue. And when that's done, the data provider, generally speaking, needs to create an errata to describe why the newer data has been published. So we have the motivation, description, the severity of the issue, and whether or not the use of the previous version is discouraged or not, uh, which is uh, in 99% of the cases, uh, there is no discouragement of using the data, but you just be, need to be warned that there is maybe a metadata that is not right or something like that. Uh, so this tool is also still under the constant development, which is something that we do at IPSL. And it is a huge investment on our part. And we, for the time being, for non-authenticated users, so for the general public, it's uh, available on read only. So you cannot create new issues like you do on GitHub, but we are working to soon make it open for general public um, to create issues that will be moderated afterwards from the data providers. So that's it for my part. Uh, I know there is a lot of dense information that is uh, that has been presented here. I tried to make it as non-technical as possible. And I provided all the links about all the things that I have mentioned in my presentation, mainly the Cinder GitHub rep repository where you will find all the required information, documentation, source code, et cetera. The errata, the ESDoc re repo, which will have all the uh, documentation hub. And finally, I put the ESGF landing page that can ping you towards all the ESGF nodes that are implied within the ESGF uh, project. Uh, the links that I have mentioned should be uh, up and running. And if you need any help whatsoever into using these data, now you can contact me on my email. I will try my best either to answer your questions or point you to the right towards the right direction for the person that will answer that question for you. Uh, that's it for me. Uh, Fabrizio, I hand the, uh, uh, the screen to you. Let me share again my screen. Okay, um, in this, uh, my microphone, yes. Uh, in this last block of the webinar, we learn how to join the Ines Data Space Service and uh, how to get started with some of the Python modules available in the computing environment. As shown in one of the last slides of the first presentation, the Ines Data Space provides a web portal that you can access through the URL on the bottom of this slide. 
The home page contains general information about the service and its main features. The um, notebook section is a gallery showing the ready to use example that you can find in your uh, workspace within the corresponding folder. And uh, the access section will guide you through all the steps needed to access the service. The registration process consists of two main steps. First, you need to sign up for an account for accessing the EGI services. Here, you can use the preferred identity provider. And uh, as part of this process, you will be assigned a personal unique EGI ID, which will be then used across all uh, the EGI tools and, and services. And then you need to join the in as a virtual organization. To do that, you can follow the link shared in the slide in point through, fill in the compilation form and wait for the approval by the VO manager. Then you will be notified by email after, uh, and after that you should be able to log in to the service through the URL provided in point three. And now let's move to the practical part of the webinar where we'll see how to exploit in TechASM to search and load CMS6 datasets and how to exploit Ophidia and its Python bindings by Ophidia to perform a climate data analysis. And uh, here just uh, um, some useful links um, about the main services and tools involved in the activities. So let me switch to the other uh, window. So after the authentication and the authorization phase, this is how the Jupyter Lab workspace looks like. We have already seen during the presentation that the workspace contains three folders. And in particular, as you can see, the data folder contains the CMIP datasets organized according to the directory structure defined for CMIP6. And uh, uh, in addition, there are two files used by Intechasm, the CSV file, which is the catalog file containing the data assets location and the associated metadata, for example, institution, experiment, model, and variable, and so on. And uh, the JSON file, uh, which is the ESM collection definition file, where we need to link the catalog file and provide a set of controlled vocabularies, each one corresponding to a metadata field. The data asset um, uh, field, basically the path um, to the NetSDF uh, data files in our case, and uh, uh, an aggregation control block to specify how the query results should be merged and concatenated into the resulting datasets. And all this information provided in the, in the input JSON file tell us what we expect to find inside the catalog and how to open it. Now let's start with the first notebook, uh, where as anticipated, we'll learn how to use IntakeASM and in addition, how to exploit XArray, Matplotlib and uh, Cartopy to perform a very simple analysis and show the result on a map. To learn more about XArray, you can have a look at the Quick Start XArray Matplotlib notebook under the notebook folder, which provides several examples on how to easily manipulate a sample data set with XArray and show the result with Matplotlib. So here, as first step, we import the intake module, and then we have to open the collection definition file, which is the JSON file located under the data folder in the home directory. To do that, we use the open ESM data store function. In this way, uh, intake has, will establish a link to the database that is the CSV file containing the data assets location and the associated metadata. The catalog file is um, updated daily according to the um, data download plan, while the collection definition file is uh, created by the administrator. So uh, knowing where it is and loading it is enough to search and discover data through intake ASM. The output shows that at the moment, the CMIP6 catalog contains 113 datasets for a total of about 154,000 assets location. That is the uh, files in a NetCDF format, which is a data format for storing multidimensional scientific data, such as temperature, humidity, precipitation, and so on. 
In addition, uh, the output provides some aggregate information over the metadata fields, which represents the uh, core components to describe the, the CMIP6 datasets according to the data reference syntax. So for example, in our catalog, the available datasets refer to 22 different institu institutions, 28 models as indicated in the source D row and uh, as shown by Atef in uh, his presentation. And we have four different experiments and six variables in total. The in-memory uh, representation of the CAD for the catalog is a pandas data frame. So basically a two dimensional data structure containing labeled axis. So we can inspect it with call.df, and then we can use the add function, which, he, uh, which by default uh, returns the first five rows of the table associated to the catalog. We can then retrieve unique values for some of the metadata fields, for example, the source ID and the experiment ID, and these we can, this uh, can help us to know what data sets are available and to probably select them. So in our example, uh, we are interested in uh, CMCC data sets about the CMCC, CM3, SR5 model. The task variable, which is the near surface, usually two meter air tem temperature and the SSP585 experiment. Intake provides the functionality to execute queries against the catalog. We can use the search function providing uh, as input argument the query to execute against the data frame. The query is defined here as a Python dictionary consisting of a list of key values pairs where the key is the name of a CMIP6 metadata field and the value, the corresponding value to be used as search criteria for that metadata. The resulting object is a new catalog with a subset of the entries of the initial catalog. Again, we can access the new catalog with cat.df. In this case, we have only one entry corresponding to the file satisfying, satisfying the search criteria. Cat.keys is used to get all the keys for the catalog entries. And as we can see, each key in SMIP6 is the, is the concatenation of some specific metadata fields. When we are satisfied with the results of our query, we can ask in TechASM to load data assets into X-Array datasets. And to do this, we use the to dataset dict function. We can inspect the return dictionary of datasets, only one in this case, and the output shows for each X-Array dataset several information like the coordinates, the data variables, and some other attributes, which are uh, uh, basically the so-called global attributes used in CIMI6 to enrich a data file. We can now perform a simple analysis, for example, the temporal mean over the whole time series from January 2015 to December 2100, as shown for the um, time dimension. And uh, we can plot the result using the X-Array plot function, which in turn calls the X-Array.plot.pcolorMatch function since data is true dimension. In addition, we can also exploit Matplotlib and Cartopy to create a publication quality map. Here, we have to choose a specific map projection, plate carry in this case, draw cost lines and grid lines, and then add the data to the map by retrieving the values for the variable and for the dimension from the previously created mean object. And this is the resulting map related to the temporal mean calculated for the near surface air temperature over the whole time series available in the data set we selected. The second notebook provides some basic examples on how to use uh, the OFITA framework features for climate data analysis. And um, in particular, it shows some of the main command from the PyOphidia module. PyOphidia is an open source Python library developed by CMCC to interact with the OFIDA framework. 
and it represents the uh, programmatic interface for that framework. I'll skip uh, some other details that you can find in the notebook. So in, um, um, in this first cell, we are importing the Pyophilia module, which consists uh, of two main classes, the client class and the cube class. And before uh, submitting any command, we need to set up a connection with the Ophelia server. And to do that, we can use the set client class method and uh, set the readm to true to automatically retrieve the connection argument from the environment. After running this cell, uh, we have uh, uh, some information about the, um, the user session. Once the connection has been set up, we can call all the instance and class method of the cube model to submit the corresponding operator on the Ophelia server side components. So in this notebook, we intentionally skip all these steps to search and discover data sets through IntakeASP, and um, uh, we use the same file used in the previous uh, notebook. We can explore the structure of the NetCDF file by using the explore and see method. As we can see, it, contain, it contains um, a three-dimensional variable called TAS, which is organized with respect to the time, latitude, and uh, longitude dimensions. And the output also show a list of global attributes used to better describe the data file. To create a new data cube from uh, an SDF file, we'll use the import and see true method, which is a wrapper of the OPH uh, import and see true operator, which relies on the IO server to perform parallel IO with the underlying storage system. Here, we are specifying through the int team argument that we want to import data so that the values on the array are organized according to the time dimension. And uh, this is important uh, um, since uh, um, we improve the efficiency of the analysis that we are going to run. We need to specify the path where the file is located, the name of the measure related to the NetSDF, to the NetSDF file, and uh, uh, we can also add the short description for the cube is being imported. The method creates a new data cube on uh, the Ophidia server side components. And um, um, at this stage, nothing is being read from uh, the file on the notebook since the MyCube object just contains a reference to the cube available on the server side. To inspect the cube structure and its dimension, uh, as well as um, how uh, it, is, it has been partitioned, we can run the info method on the MyCube object. The, all, the output also show the data size and the number of elements while the uh, dimension information table shows the uh, cube dimensions and their sizes. We can also inspect the virtual file system with the list method. This shows that uh, we have uh, one uh, data cube in the user uh, space created with the previous import command. The PID provides a persistent unique identifier associated to this cube, while the description argument using the import helps to relate each data cube to the corresponding operator in a more mnemonic way. Once the first cube has been created, we can run the Ophidia Analytics operator to process data. In this cell, we are performing a subset of the original cube on the time dimension by using the dimension indexes as specified with the subset names and subset type arguments. And in particular, we want to, we want to extract the first 60 time steps as indicated in the subset filter argument. The method will create a new data cube object on the server side components without modifying the original one. And also in this case, my cube true will just hold the reference to this new cube. The explore method allows us to see the values stored in the data cube. The limit filter argument tells the method to retrieve just the first line of the data cube. So for example, here are the temperature values associated to the first spatial point. The method also allows specifying a subset filter as in the subset method in order to inspect only the values we are interested in. Here, for example, we are displaying the temperature values for eight spatial points and four timestamps for each of them. Note that the subset dims argument is now set to a pipe separated list of dimensions and the same is for the subset filter argument. Let's now perform a data reduction operation on the subsetted cube to compute, for example, the maximum over the whole time series. 
We can do that by using the reduce method. The uh, operation argument is used to specify that we want to compute the maximum over the array. And now we can uh, use the results produced by the data reduction operation to get a map. The uh, export array method allows moving uh, the data from the server side components into a Python friendly structure on the notebook. And uh, this data can then easily you can be easily used with other Python libraries such as Cartopy, Matplotlib, and uh, NumPy. As we can see in the picture, the retirement structure is basically a Python dictionary with two main keys, measure and dimension. The measure contains a single subdictionary filled with the variable values organized according to the, the dimension order. And the dimension key contains multiple subdictionary, one for each dimension, the uh, latitude and longitude in our case. And this, for example, is the output related to the dimension value extracted from the MyCube tree object with the values for the latitude and longitude dimensions. In uh, this cell, we implement a function using Cartopy and Matplotlib for the plotting and the NumPy for minor adjustment to the data structure. And then uh, um, we are using the measure and the dimension keys to access the values uh, uh, of the exported uh, data. And this is the corresponding map. Now, if we run again the list method, we see that the virtual file system contains several data cubes, each one related to uh, a command executing in this notebook, import, uh, subset, and reduce, as indicated in the uh, description uh, column. Once we have done with uh, the analysis, we can use the delete container method to uh, clear the space and delete all the cubes uh, uh, generated uh, in the notebook. And as we can see, the cube space is now empty. So now I don't know if we have time to see uh, the last notebook, which is uh, um, an example of uh, climate index, uh, in particular the tropical night, the tropical nights uh, climate index. Uh, I don't know, Hin, uh, please let me know if I can uh, continue. We, we have to stop here. Uh it is about time. Um, yes. Anyway, anyway, people can um, can find this notebook uh, under the notebooks 